The following is a message from Christ Central Manchester, a church that meets in the heart of Manchester in the UK. To find out more about us, please visit www.christcentral.org.uk. This morning we're carrying on in our series, Father, Son and Spirit. And uh, last week we looked at the Trinity, if you missed it, some juicy heresies that we uh, talked about last week, different pictures of what the Trinity heresies just kind of um, untrue, you know, true teaching about uh, God that isn't biblical, isn't from the Bible. And so we looked at some of that last week, looked at things like the clover leaf and water and things that we have used as helpful illustrations that actually in the end become heresy uh, when you follow them through. So if you want to see that, you can get that on the website. But this morning we're going to carry on and we're looking, as you can see on the screen, we're looking at the whole topic of our Father. So we're going to go through the Trinity, Father, Son and Spirit over the next couple of weeks. Just to say that we do normally go through, when we're preaching, our normal kind of practice, our normal diet would be to preach through a whole book of the Bible and to sort of let the Bible breathe, let the Bible speak for itself. But in this, obviously, you you can't quite as easily do that. We're going to look at a couple of passages, of course, from the Bible, but we're looking at themes. We're looking at the theme of the Godhead of the Trinity, and we're looking at the theme of this morning, the Father. So, um, but just to say that isn't our normal way of doing things. We prefer just to talk through the Bible, find verses that even tell us to honour those in authority, as I mentioned already. You wouldn't actually go to those kind of verses if you didn't have to. But when we go through a book of the Bible, you have to preach the whole thing, even the uncomfortable bits. So, so we're going to look at the Father, and as we do that, we'll see that what's going to happen is, when we look at the Son and the Spirit, the same thing's going to happen I'm not going to be able to talk about one of the um, persons of the Godhead without including the other two. Because it's so wrapped up in each other's work, as it were. So wrapped up in each other's um, relating to us. That we will keep referring to the Son and the Spirit, even when we're talking about the Father. And likewise with the other two, that everyone's involved. And it's the, the Spirit that helps us, as we'll see, for example, cry out, Dad, Daddy, Father. As, as we'll see in a moment. A famous preacher called Charles Spurgeon, who uh, was around in the 1800s, he tells, or told the story of a father and son who went out from their home into the city one day. And the father, knowing that he had business to attend to that day, uh, left clear instructions with his young son to stay by a particular gate of the city until his father had finished his business and come back to him. Well, the father went about his business visiting many customers and forgot completely about this lad. Night came on and at last the father reached home and there was a great inquiry as to where Richard was. This is using slightly older language. There was a big load of noise. The father said, dear me, or words to that effect, I've left him. I left him early in the morning, in the morning, standing under such and such a gateway and I told him to stay there till I came for him. I should not wonder that he is there still now. So they went and they found him. Such an example of childish, simple faithfulness. It is no disgrace to emulate, Spurgeon says. And then he goes on to say, I received some years ago orders from my master, my father, to stand at the foot of the cross until he came. He has not come yet. Oh, yeah, Jesus hasn't returned. The world still ticks along. He hasn't come yet, but I mean to stand there till he does. And then Spurgeon carries on. Here then I stand at the foot of the cross and tell out the old, old story, stale though it sound to itching ears and worn threadbare as critics may deem it. It is of Christ I love to speak, of Christ who loved and lived and died the substitute for sinners, the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God the Father. This morning, we're talking about the Father. We're telling an old, old story. We've talked about the Father before, how loving, how accepting, how forgiving, all because of what the Son did. And so we stand, as Spurgeon says, at the foot of the cross, and we happily go back to the old, old story, because nothing's changed, including my need to stay there. 
And I want us to revisit this theme of us being royal sons and daughters of the loving Father this morning. I want us to revisit that. And I want us to learn more and more what it is to remain there until he takes us home or until he comes back. This old, old story of orphans that we were, of slaves that we were, who have been made sons and daughters. And so this morning, very simply, two things. We're going to look at the Father, and then secondly, our Father. Just a slight change in words, but huge. He's not just the Father, he's become ours. First of all, we're going to just look at some of the biblical teaching about the Father. He obviously was there at the beginning, and way before that. With the Holy Spirit and with Jesus the Son, they created the world. In Acts 17, verse 28, Paul states that all humanity is God's offspring. In a sense, we're all children of God in one sense. We're all made in his image. And so right from Adam and Eve onwards, we all are, all can be called his offspring. We then obviously blow it and fall away from him. But still there's a sense in which we've been made in his image, we're his offspring. But then he chooses a particular nation, Israel, and says, I'm going to be your dad. I'm going to be your father now. Through Abraham, through others. And, then, and at times, he, he comes along and visits individual people and says, look, I'm your, I'm your father. So is it to David? In, we see that in one particular instance in 2 Samuel 7 where he's described as David's father. He's also described, I don't know if you know this, God isn't male or female. Did you know that? He's God. He made us in his image, male and female. He's not restricted in the same way. And in Isaiah 49, we read of God being described as a mother. It doesn't mean we suddenly start calling God Mother God, because Jesus never did. The Bible rarely does. All the Bible writers were happy to call him Father. So I suggest we stick with that. Good enough for Jesus is good enough for me. But in Isaiah 49, we get this God being happy to be described with this metaphor of a mum, of a mother. Elsewhere, he's described as a rock or a shield or a shelter. It doesn't mean we start calling him it. Okay? But, but he is described as a mother here in Isaiah 49. It says in Isaiah 49, 15, Can a mother forget the baby at her breast and have no compassion on the child she has born? Though she may forget, I will not forget you. Compassion of a mother. The point the writer is making is that there is compassion in the world. We have compassion, don't we? Maybe fleeting compassion as we're watching the news and we see uh, suffering in another part of the, of the world. And for a moment our hearts are moved. We might even well up and tear up. But then it quickly subsides, sadly. But then there's the, pa- the compassion of a missionary. Going to a, and it doesn't mean going abroad, but the, the one on a mission, going into a particular area and, and, and helping, treating, even those that may be undeserving of that compassion or rejecting that compassion, still having compassion. But that can be short-lived. What it's saying is, is that then there's the unconditional love and compassion of a mum who in the middle of the night, being woken from her sleep, will go and look after that baby who's crying and who has woken her up, who even might in their teenage years reject that compassion and care and throw it back at the mum, still the unconditional compassion will be there. But it even then says it's even better than that because it suggests that even mums can run out of compassion. Though she may forget, I will not forget you. So it's helpful to know God described in different ways. We get a deeper understanding of him. He is this compassionate parent who is usually described as a father. But really importantly at this point, rarely in the Old Testament is God the Father referred to as my father by anyone. I don't know if you've ever noticed that. Never happens. Never referred to in this kind of personal one-on-one way. 
He's talked about as the father of many, the father of Israel. He's talked about in Jeremiah 3 that one day he will be, he will be able to be called, or we will be able to, be, to call him my father. It's like a prophecy of what will come, but it's not actually, not actually something that happens. Some, so you don't hear of anyone really saying, my father. No one seems to do it until Jesus. Jesus prays to the Father, talks to his Father, says things like, in my Father's house, says we have his Father as our Father now. He, says our, to get us, he tells us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven. Friends, we don't often take it in or, or we don't fully notice it. This shift, when Jesus arrived on our planet and called God the Father, my Father, was huge. It was massive. So much so it got him into trouble, big trouble. It seems the word Father used to describe God is only used a handful of times. In fact, it's only used about 15 times in the whole of the Old Testament. And then Jesus comes along... And just Jesus, in the Gospels, uses God the Father 150 times. The whole thing has shifted. Like I said, it got him in some big trouble. John 5.18 records the trouble Jesus got in. By calling God Father, it says the people around him, the religious authorities said, saw it as claiming equality with God. It was massive. You didn't do it. If you did it, you were claiming equality with God, which is kind of why I think no one ever did it. Now, he wasn't just doing it because he was God. He was doing it because he was showing us a new day, a new way. Though actually the thing had changed because he was now here. And we'll read that in a moment from Galatians 4 and the wonderful truth that we see in there. But this turn... Is a, is this word that Jesus used was not only unique because he even knew, because he first of all said Father, he called God my Father. It was a, it was an affectionate term. It was a, it was Abba. It was Father, my Dad, Daddy, Dad. It wasn't just the the Daddy of a small child. It was Dad of of an adult child, if, if you know what I mean. It was it was a kind of affectionate word for Dad that anyone would use for their Dad who had a good relationship with their Dad. It was beautiful, but it was world changing. It was ground breaking, and whatever other phrase you want to use, it was amazing. And the whole thing was mind blowing, especially for the religious people of the day. And so we go from that into how this then relates to you and me. How do we now, because of Jesus, how do we now relate to the Father as our Father? In Galatians 3, I said we'd read it, and it will appear on the screen. Paul outlines here, we'll read it in a moment. He outlines the difference between our relating to God before Christ and after Jesus, and after, after Jesus' finished work on the cross. Let's read it from Galatians 3, verse 26 into chapter 4. Galatians 3 verse 26. So in Christ Jesus you are all children of God through faith. For all of you who were baptised into Christ have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Gentile, neither slave nor free, uh, nor is there male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I am saying is that as long as an heir is underage, he is no different from a slave. Although he owns the whole estate, the heir is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by his father. So also, when we were underage, we were in slavery under the elemental spiritual forces of the world. But when the set time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under the law, that we might receive adoption to sonship. So man and female now, we're all adopted into sonship. Because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son. See what I mean? The Holy Spirit, I talked about it earlier. Talked about him, the Holy Spirit, 
being the one by whom we can say, Abba, Father. So verse 6, because you are his sons, God sent the spirit of his son into our hearts. The spirit who calls out, Abba, Father, Daddy, Dad, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but God's child. And since you are his child, God has made you also an heir. We are all now sons of God, it says. Male and female, whatever background you're from, whatever political persuasion you are from, whatever, educational background, how much money you might have, none of it is relevant. You are, if you know Jesus, you are now a son with Jesus, the son. All equal, alongside each other, whether you're a mayor or a street cleaner, you are equal in the eyes of God now. And all of us now have permission to call God Dad. All of us, and it doesn't matter what you've done wrong, if you've said, I'm sorry for the stuff I've done wrong, and Jesus, I love you, I want to follow you, forgive me for the stuff I've done wrong. If you've said that, and if that's become an ongoing thing for you, because it doesn't stop, then you can sit on your dad's lap, as it were, and know that you are his. You can run to him, be embraced by him. In fact, he will run to you, as we see in the prodigal son story. The experience now is a full one that we would not have known before Jesus. These key words in verse 6 of chapter 4 of Galatians, God has sent the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. See it elsewhere in Romans. We get to call him by the Holy Spirit. We get to call him that. Same way Jesus did. Same way Jesus did and Jesus was condemned as a blasphemer. Somebody who was taking God's name in vain. He was, he was talked about as one who was blasphemous because he called, dared to call dad, God Dad. So you and I get to do this blasphemous thing every day. It's that outrageous that you and I get to call God Dad. It is outrageous. It was outrageous then. It's still outrageous. It's not blasphemy. Blasphemy, it never was. It was a wrong accusation. But it was outrageous. And it is still outrageous that we get to call God Dad. It is. It's wonderful. It's outrageous. It speaks of his outrageous, extravagant love for you and me. And so, if that's true, if we are now allowed to be outrageous and call God Dad, why on earth do we still come back to him as slaves and orphans as we sometimes do? We do it. Paul's having a go at the Galatians for doing it. Why are, you, why are you doing all these things to perform and pretend that you're still a slave? You've got to go through these rituals and, and honour these particular days of the year. And, and that's your way of getting in with God. That if you don't do these things, you won't be accepted. You're already in. You've already got this outrageous thing that you can do. Why are you coming along like a beggar? Why are you coming along saying, you know, please serve some more. Can I come in? You're allowed in. You have access fully in. You are in. And yet we sometimes still go back to our orphan mentality. Mainly, do you know why? Mainly, you know why. Because of something we did this week. Oh, I'm not worthy. Now we're to say, God forgive me. But at no point were you not worthy. Jesus died for you. For the stuff you've done wrong, past, present and future stuff that you have done will do wrong. It's awesome. It's, out, it's outrageous. And that's sometimes why I think we don't, quite, we don't quite believe it. We can't quite believe, as we'll get to in a moment, that God the Father sings over us. That God the Father would celebrate you. We just see ourselves as we've got used to seeing ourselves. Maybe a little bit with a glass half empty view of ourselves. Maybe the way that other people have seen us. 
Maybe the, the way that other people have disapproved of us. Maybe the, other way, the way that people have looked down upon us. We've got used to that so much so we can't believe that someone would be wanting to celebrate us and, and accept us and draw us close and call us their son or daughter and love us with an endless, unconditional love that will never run dry into all eternity. That's who you are now. And yet we so easily forget it and act so differently. It's pointless, but we still sometimes do it. I'm a slave. I'm an orphan. No, you're not. And nor am I. You're a son. You're a royal son. We've got, well, I've said this a hundred million, you know, I've said this enough, but I will never stop saying it, because you can never say it enough. He loves you. He is your dad. And he wants to know you more. Further verses that speak of how the Father relates to us now that we're in Jesus. I've got a long list. Long list. And it's not exhausting the whole of what the Bible says about you and me. Very quickly. If you want this, I can give it to you afterwards. Or if you want, you can just take a picture of these. Or I can just put this in front of you. 1 John 3 verse 1, he loves us. Psalm 103 verse 13 and 14, that's now true of us in Jesus. He understands you and me. Matthew 6 verse 32, he takes care of our needs. Matthew 7 verse 11, gives, he gives us many good gifts. Especially Luke 11 13, the gift of the Holy Spirit. Galatians 4 verse 7, we've already looked at the promises of, of our great inheritance in heaven as heirs with Christ. Revelation 2 and three talks of the eternal promise of privilege and blessing because we are children of the king and members of the royal family who will reign with Christ. Romans 8 verse 14, even the Holy Spirit being with us is a sign of our sonship. Hebrews 12 verse 5 and 6, discipline. Less popular part of the whole thing of being a son or daughter, discipline of the father. He disciplines the one, ones he loves. It's a privilege that we are disciplined by him. It doesn't always feel like it, but it is. What's more worrying is when he wouldn't discipline us. When we're left to our own devices, that's when we should be worried. But he loves us. Same way a parent, a good parent, would want to stop their child running into the road, especially if it's the M60. You would stop them. And you might even tell them off, or you should tell them off. In a loving way. Are you crazy? <laughs> that would be loving. Probably, actually. Give them a shock. They didn't already get shocked by the fact that they were stood by the side of the M60. He would discipline you and say, I'm going to cut you back from that stupid step you're about to make. Because I love you. Sometimes it doesn't feel very nice. I'm disappointed. This, this didn't work out. That didn't work out. Maybe you don't know why he pulled you back from that step. He's now your father. All these verses are true of us. He loves us. He cares for us. He disciplines us. He's given us so much in Jesus and his spirit. But also, the father has given him himself. And we can go to him now, address him as father, knowing total acceptance, knowing love, everlasting love. And if you're not convinced by this, or have struggled to accept it in the past, mainly because of your earthly experience of a dad, then I'd love to pray with you at the end. And I would just encourage you, and I will get in, in, again at the end, just to keep exposing yourself to this kind of teaching. Go and find stuff about the Father heart of God. You need to keep hearing it more than other people need to hear it. Because you've got to rewire your heart and your mind and have your mind renewed, as it says in the New Testament, in Romans. We need our minds renewed, and especially in particular areas. For different people, it'd be different things. But if you've had a, a bad experience of a dad, and none of us have had a perfect dad, but if you've had a really tough time with your dad, or you've never known your dad, and it's so hard then to relate to God as your dad, then go and find stuff about the Father heart of God. I can show you the kind of things to go and read or listen to. But also it would be great to pray with you. And we'll do that at the end. But another reason we sometimes don't see that God is our Father or accept it is that, again, as I've said already, the stuff we've done wrong. 
And we guys, we've got to just get a better understanding of who we are in Christ, a better understanding of who we are with God as our dad. You don't, you don't suddenly go from the top of the tree to the bottom of the tree because you've done something wrong. Yeah, you've got to deal with that. You've got to repent of it and turn away from it, which is what repentance means. And keep fighting. But he got his son. With Jesus, you're now in sonship with Jesus. You're his son. And you were never worthy of his love. Did you know that? You were never worthy of it. It's not like you were once upon a time nice. You've never been worthy. You were only ever made worthy because of Jesus. So you can't make yourself unworthy because it was never about you in the first place. It was about what Jesus did for you. You're wrapped up in him now. You're wrapped up in the name of Jesus. You're wrapped up in Jesus himself. When you were baptised, if you were baptised, and if you weren't, I encourage you to think about that and look, in th- look at that and chat with you about that more. When you are baptised into the waters of baptism, it says you're wrapped up in Jesus' death and raised to Jesus' resurrection, Jesus' life. You're wrapped up in him now. What's true of him is true of you. Apart from the God bit. You're now in Christ. You know when Jesus tells the prodigal son story? Do you know the prodigal son story? Two sons, one's a goody two shoes, older brother, ends up being a bit of a scumbag towards the end of the story. Looks the to, looks to part, isn't. Younger brother, absolute scumbag, runs off, squanders the dad's inheritance. Nightmare. As he's on his way back, having blown it, the father runs to the son. Jesus tells that story for a couple of reasons. One, to shock the older brothers listening, because there's a few of those. But two, to welcome in the younger brothers who were listening. The younger brothers and sisters who were listening knew when Jesus told that story, this whole thing is marvellous. I was going to say magic, but it wouldn't be helpful. This whole thing, which is why it became, came out as marvellous, this whole thing is world changing because the, the, the story is called the prodigal son and actually it should be called the prodigal dad because the word prodigal means extravagant reckless almost recklessly extravagant and the son was that he ran off squandered all the wealth extrav- extravagantly recklessly wrongly but the father extravagantly, recklessly lavishes rightly, in his, because he's made it right, rightly lavishes extravagant love on the son. It should be called the prodigal dad or the prodigal God. And Jesus is shocking everybody with his story. It's the, probably one of the most powerful parables he tells. It's the whole gospel in a parable. And this, the big kind of stumbling block for the older brothers that were listening and the wonderful news for the younger brothers who were listening was when the father ran. Because our older gentlemen, respectable gentlemen, especially in Middle Eastern times, especially a couple of thousand years ago, they didn't run anywhere. I mean, they just didn't. He runs. No dignity, doesn't care about his dignity, runs towards the son. Lavishes care and love. And combined with verses like verse 17 of Zephaniah 3, where it says, the father sings over you. The prodigal son story is the best news ever for all of us. I want to read you, just in closing, Philip Yancey a few years ago wrote a modern day version of the prodigal son. Changed it to the prodigal daughter. But remember, it's all about the prodigal God, the prodigal father. I want to read this to you in closing. A young girl grows up on a cherry orchard just above Traverse City in Michigan. Her parents, a bit old-fashioned, tend to overreact to her nose ring, the music she listens to, and the length of her skirts. They ground her a few times, and she seethes inside. I hate you, she says one day as her dad knocks on the door of her room in an argument, after an argument. And that night, she acts on the plan that she has mentally rehearsed scores of times. She runs away. She's visited Detroit only once before on a bus trip with her church youth group to watch the Tigers play. I think that's a team rather than actual Tigers. (laughs) 
Because newspapers in Traverse City report in lurid detail the gangs, the drugs, and the violence in downtown Detroit, she concludes that that's probably the last place her parents will ever look for her. California, maybe, or Florida, but not Detroit. Her second day there, she meets a man who drives the biggest car she's ever seen. He offers her a ride, buys her lunch, arranges for her to have a place to stay. He gives her some pills that make her feel better than she's ever felt before. She was right all along, she decides. Her parents were keeping her from all the fun. The good life continues for a month, two months, a year. The man with the big car, she calls him boss. He teaches her a few things that men like. And since she's underage, men pay a premium for her. She lives in a penthouse and orders room service whenever she wants. Occasionally she thinks about the folks back home, but their lives seem now so boring and provincial that she can hardly believe she grew up there. She has a brief scare when she sees her picture printed on the back of a milk carton one day with the headline, Have you seen this child? But by now, she's got blonde hair and with all the makeup and the body piercing jewelry that she wears, nobody would mistake her for a child. Besides, most of her friends are runaways and nobody squeals in Detroit. After a year, the first sallow signs of illness appear and it amazes her how fast the boss turns mean. These days, we can't mess around, he growls, and before she knows it, she's out on the street without a penny to her name. She still turns a couple of tricks a night, but they won't pay much, and all the money goes to support her habit. When winter blows in, she finds herself sleeping on metal grates outside the big department stores, and sleeping is the wrong word. A teenage girl at night in downtown, downtown Detroit can never relax her guard. Dark bands circle her eyes, her cough worsens. One night she lies awake listening for footsteps. All of a sudden everything about her life looks different. She no longer feels like a woman of the world. She feels like a little girl lost in a cold and frightening city. She begins to whimper. Her pockets are empty and she's hungry. She needs a fix. She pulls her legs tight underneath her and shivers under the newspapers that she's piled on top of her coat. Something jolts a synapse of memory and a single image fills her mind of May in Traverse City when a million cherry tree blossoms, when a million trees bloom at once and with her golden retriever dashing through the rows and rows of blossomy trees in chase of a tennis ball. God, why did I leave? She says to herself and pain stabs at her heart. My dog back home eats better than I do now. She's sobbing and she knows in a flash that more than anything else in the world, she wants to go home. Three straight phone calls, three straight connections with the answer machine. She hangs up without leaving a message the first two times, but the third time she says, Dad, Mum, it's me. I was wondering about maybe coming home. I'm catching a bus up your way and it will get there about midnight tomorrow. If you're not there, well, I guess I'll just stay on the bus until it hits Canada. It takes about seven hours for a bus to make all the stops between Detroit and Traverse City and during that time she realises the flaws in her plan. What if her parents are out of town and, and miss the message? Shouldn't she have waited another day or so until she could talk to them? And even if they are home, they probably wrote her off as dead long ago. She should have given them some time to overcome the shock. Her thoughts bounce back and forth between those worries and the speech that she's preparing for her father. Dad, I'm sorry. I know I was wrong. It's not your fault. It's all mine. Dad, can you forgive me? She says the words over and over, her throat tightening even as she rehearses them. She hasn't apologised to anyone in years. The bus has been driving with the lights on since Bay City. Tiny snowflakes hit the pavement, rubbed warm by thousands of tyres. She's forgotten how dark it gets out at night out here. A deer darts across the road and the bus swerves only so... Every so often, a billboard. Every so often, a sign posting the mileage to Traverse City. Oh, God. When the bus finally rolls into the station, its air brakes hissing in protest, the driver announces in a crackly voice over the microphone, 15 minutes, folks. That's all we have here. 15 minutes to decide her life. She checks herself in a compact mirror, smooths her hair, and licks lipstick off her teeth. She looks at the tobacco stains on her fingertips and wonders if her parents will notice and if they're even there. She walks into the terminal not knowing what to expect. Not one of the thousand scenes that she's played out in her mind prepares her for what she sees. There, in the concrete walls and the plastic chairs, 
in the bus terminal in Traverse City, Michigan, stands a group of 40 brothers and sisters and great aunts and uncles and cousins and a grandmother and a great grandmother. They're all wearing they're all wearing goofy party hats and blowing noisemakers and taped across the entire wall of the terminal is a computer generated banner that reads welcome home out of the crowd of well-wishers breaks her dad she stares out through the tears quivering in her eyes like hot mercury and begins the memorized speech dad i'm sorry i know and he interrupts her Hush, child. We've got no time for that. No time for apologies. You'll be late for the party. A banquet's waiting for you at home. <coughs> if the band would like to come up, please. Friends, the father is now our father, is now your father. And that story is all of us. Even the nice middle class versions of that, even the nice didn't get it that wrong versions of that, we are still those who have been brought home, welcomed home with celebration. And like I said, Zephaniah 319 was a prophetic, futuristic truth. He sings over you, he celebrates, he runs. He gets the fattened calf as it was in Jesus' day and, and lavishes you with celebration. And many of us can't accept that. But I'm, a, I'm asking you to rethink that this morning and accept it. That he is now your dad. And if you've known him for years, he's been your dad for years. And even before that, he knew you. Even before you were born, he knew you. Even before the world was made, he chose you in Ephesians 1. Before the creation of the world, he chose us in him to be holy and blameless in his sight. It's there. You can't argue with it. But you might not fully accept it. I'm asking you this morning, ask him to help you fully accept it. It doesn't matter what you've done wrong. It doesn't matter how bad your dad was. It just might be harder to accept. And you might need help. And as I said already, if that's you, I'd love to pray with you. And in fact, I'd love to do that now before we even finish. Would you? If that, it's a bold thing to do, I know. And if you can't do it now, that's fine. You can come and see me afterwards. But if you'd like to do that now, if, if for either reason, just or, or other reasons that I haven't even mentioned, you just find it hard to relate to Dad as, your, as God, to, to God the Father as your Dad, as your Father. Would you stand? Because I'd love to pray with you. Stand right now. I appreciate you might not want to do this. In which case, as we stand together in a moment and worship God together, it'd be less, con less conspicuous. You can come and just see me down here. I'd love to pray with you. Or, even less obvious than that, you can just ask somebody near you that you trust and know to just pray with you. I struggle with this for this reason. Could be any of the reasons I've said or others. I struggle with this. Could you help me? And then I'd urge you, keep going at this. Don't. I would hate for anyone in this church to go year after year after year in our church, on my watch as it were, not knowing really the full acceptance of the Father, of that the God is their dad. I'd hate that. It would break our hearts as pastors to know that there's people here that don't know him as their dad. So can I urge you to fight this? And can I urge you, if you know someone who's admitted that this is tough for them to accept, could you fight for them with them? If they're in your group or if they're just a friend of yours, let's fight this together. And let's, let's get each other to a place where we know him as our dad. Where you know that you are no longer a nobody. He has made you a somebody. We talked about that last week. That we don't come to him as slaves. We come to him as sons and daughters royal daughters, royal sons. As we worship together, like I said, please, either come and see me, pray with somebody, get them to pray for you. As we stand and worship, I'd love you just to get your connect card out of your drink, drink holder. If you're a guest with us, we'd just love to hear from you so that we can just let you know things that are happening. We also really appreciate feedback, positive and constructive. 
about how the mind's gone. So we really do value that. So you can just take that out now as we sing together and just fill that in. And as the offering buckets go around, just pop them in, in that. Let's stand together. Father, thank you, you are our dad. And that we know you as our dad. I pray for, even for, for, for those of us that know it and have accepted it and don't maybe struggle with it in a way that some others might. Lord, that we would go to the new depths of knowing I'm loved by my father. Just know new depths of, of relating and intimacy and friendship with you. And Lord, we love to know you more and more. And I know, we know that you love to grow in, in fellowship and relationship with us. So Lord, we pray for depths, new depths, new understandings. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's worship together.